So, everybody, uh, we are talking about the circulation. Uh, in last lecture, uh, I showed you the arterial system. Important arteries or major arteries in the body. Today, first we will see the venous system. The major veins in your body. Okay. So uh, I mentioned before that arteries take the blood away from the heart. That means large arteries give blood to the smaller arteries. Veins bring the blood towards the heart. That means what? Smaller veins give blood to the larger veins, right? Then larger veins bring the blood to the heart. <coughs> so, this picture is showing uh, the major veins of your body, but remember one thing, you have many other Hence, those are smaller in the body are not shown in this picture. It's difficult to show, show all the veins. First, uh, we will start from the larger to the smaller. Although, blood moves from the smaller vein to the larger vein. Uh, that's why we actually, instead of using the term branch, we usually use the term tributaries. Tributaries are the branches that give the blood to the larger vein. That's why uh, we say in venous system, smaller veins that give the blood to the larger vein, those are the tributaries. Anyway, so two large veins bring the deoxygenated blood into the right atrium of the heart. Those are the superior and inferior vena cava. You know that deoxygenated blood is located in the right side, right? Remember that? And who receives the blood from outside? Atrium. So, right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the body. Two veins, superior and inferior vena cava, they keep the, bring the blood into the right atrium. You see here, superior vena cava from the upper part of the body, inferior vena cava from the lower part of the body. Uh, first, we will see the superior vena cava. You see, superior vena cava divides into two right and left brachiocephalic veins. Okay? So, right and left brachiocephalic veins actually give the blood to superior vena cava. So, those are the tributaries or branches. Then, <coughs> the brachiocephalic vein, both right and left, divide into subclavian vein and internal jugular vein. So, this is the heart, okay. this is the right atrium, superior vena cava, and then inferior vena cava comes from the bottom. Okay. So, this is superior vena cava. It divides into two. This is left brachio. Cephalic vein, this is right brachiocephalic vein. 
So superior vena cava divides into two brachiocephaly. Then the brachiocephaly gives internal jugular that goes towards the head. So internal jugular and this is the subclavian. Subclavian vein. This is internal jugular Okay. Same here, this is subclavian vein, this is internal jugular vein. So you see, brachiocephaly gives internal jugular that goes towards the brain and subclavian goes under the clavicle. You remember that, right? Subclavian means under the clavicle. So, subclavian goes towards the arm, upper limb, internal jugular goes to the brain. Now, since you have internal jugular, you must have the external jugular. So, where the external jugular is, you see, external jugular is here, a branch of subclavian. So, you get external jugular tube, external jugular, this is external jugular, okay. So, this is left external jugular, this is right external jugular, this is internal jugular, right, this is left, okay. So now we got both external jugular and internal jugular vein. Now you tell me, external and internal jugular going towards the head, which one will receive deoxygenated blood from the brain, inner part, internal, right? And which one will receive deoxygenated blood from the outer part of the head, external, okay? It's like internal carotid, external carotid, make sense? So that's why you have two, internal and external jugular. In case of vein, it's jugular vein. There is no jugular artery. Okay. Then, from subclavian vein, this is the vertebral vein, and here, this is the vertebral vein. So, I am just repeating again, superior vena cava, two divisions, right and left brachiocephalic vein and then internal jugular subclavian from subclavian you see vertebral vein and external jugular vein. Okay. Now <coughs> the subclavian goes to the armpit and becomes what? Axillary vein. Make sense? Axillary vein. It's like axillary artery. And then goes to the arm and becomes brachial vein like brachial artery because this is the brachial part of the body, brachial vein. Now, in case of artery, you only saw one large artery here, that's the brachial artery, but in case of vein, you have brachial vein, but two other veins are also in the arm. They arise from the axillary vein. What are those? cephalic and basilic veins. So you see here, in the arm, there are three, basilic vein and cephalic vein, as well as the brachial vein, which corresponds to artery, but two additional large veins are present in the arm, cephalic and basilic. Make sense? Now, Cephalic and basilic, those veins are superficial veins, that means under the skin. And brachial is deep vein, present in the deeper part of the arm. <coughs> anyway, now what happens, the cephalic and basilic, when they go to the front of the elbow, here, you know, this is anticubital 
area. So these two veins get connected by another vein. That vein is called median cubital vein here. So cephalic, you see here, cephalic here, basilic here, and when they pass through the elbow area, they get connected by a vein that is called median cubital vein here. Median cubital vein uh, is the vein that we use to collect the blood for the lab. Most of the time, you know, that uh, blood is collected from the median cubital vein here, right? So that's the vein. Okay. Uh, so that's the median cubital vein. Now, you see the brachial vein which is the deeper one, when it enters into the forearm, it's like brachial artery, divides into two veins, radial and ulnar. Radial is the lateral one, ulnar is the medial one. So this is exactly same as the arterial system, axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar. Two additional veins, two additional we have here, those are not present in the arterial system, cephalic and basilic. Those are superficial. Okay, then radial and ulnar, they go, you see here, radial and ulnar, uh, they go to the uh, pump of the hand and get connected to form the superficial and deep arches, it's not mentioned here, you see two arches are formed in the palm. And then from the arches, digital veins are formed. So that's the upper limb. Now if you see the inferior vena cava, inferior vena cava, uh, passes through the diaphragm and enters into the abdominal cavity, okay, abdominal cavity. And you know, inside the abdomen, you have a number of organs and those organs, from those organs, deoxygenated blood is collected by the inferior vena cava. Deoxygenated blood is uh, taken to the inferior vena cava by a number of veins. So, hepatic vein, you know, from the liver, renal veins from the kidney, two kidneys, right and left renal veins. Uh, <coughs> you have uh, splenic vein from the spleen, okay, gonadal veins from the gonads testes, ovaries. So, those are the veins. We will talk about those uh, uh, shortly. Just know that in the abdomen, those are the veins uh, take blood from the organs, abdominal organs and uh, drain the blood into the inferior vena cava. Uh, then what happens, you see, the lower end of inferior vena cava, like abdominal aorta, similar to abdominal aorta, divides into right and left common iliac veins. And then common iliac divides into external iliac vein, internal iliac vein. So this is exactly the same as the arterial system. Internal is smaller, you must remember, as I said, internal is smaller and gives uh, 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 receives blood from the pelvic organ and external is larger and it goes to the lower lip and external becomes femoral vein when it goes to the thigh it becomes femoral vein now here again you have to remember uh, femoral vein is the deep vein, but a long vein 
arises from the upper part of femoral vein. That vein is called the great saphenous vein. It is a superficial but longest vein of the body. It starts here, you see upper part of the femur, femoral vein and goes all the way to the foot. So this is the longest vein of the body. Great saphenous vein, you see here in this picture. Starting from very upper part of femoral, it goes, you see here, all the way down to the foot. And it is superficial. So now you see, in your arm, you saw two veins, superficial veins, cephalic and basilic. You remember that? In your leg, you have another large superficial vein, that's the longest one of the body, that is called the great saphenous vein. We have to remember this because in arterial system, we don't have this. But femoral vein, we have, uh, we have femoral artery, right? Brachial artery, brachial vein. Axillary artery, axillary vein, radial, ulnar, those are same. Right? Exceptions are these. You have to remember that in venous system, we have those superficial veins, but in arteries, we don't have those. Make sense? Okay. Uh, now, uh, see here, uh, this is the femoral vein, this is the great saphenous vein. And then, uh, in the leg, in the leg, uh, the popliteal vein is just behind the knee. So, in the back of the knee, the femoral vein becomes the popliteal vein. It's like artery, femoral artery, popliteal vein. And then, anterior tibial, posterior tibial. Uh, and... Also, we have in the leg, we have fibula. So, we have anterior tibial, posterior tibial, fibula, those are like the arteries. But we have one additional vein here, large vein in the leg, that is called the small saphenous vein. We did not see small saphenous, great saphenous in arterial system. So, in the leg, basically, you have four large veins anterior tibial, posterior tibial. Fibular and a small saphenous vein. <coughs> uh, we will see in larger picture here, what I have explained to you, you now will understand. Uh, you see here, this is just one side. So you see superior vena cava, then you see uh, the brachiocephalic vein. This is the right side, so they have shown only one, this one brachiocephalic vein, right, right brachiocephalic, and then from the brachiocephalic, you see subclavian, brachiocephalic becomes subclavian, and the large branch goes towards the vein, that's the internal jugular, and then you have external jugular and vertebral from the subclavian, right, so those I have already explained to you. Uh, here, you see uh, the upper limb subclavian goes to the armpit and becomes axillary but from axillary we see two other large veins arise those are superficial cephalic vein and basilic vein and axillary becomes brachial vein which is the deeper one you see the uh, middle one brachial vein and cephalic and basalic get connected by median cubital in the front of the elbow, right? Uh, from where we collect the blood most of the time. And brachial uh, divides into two, see radial and ulnar, okay? And in, in the palm, two arches are formed, superficial palmar venous arch and deep palmar venous arches and from those arches the digital veins are the tributaries. Here you see the inferior vena cava. Okay? Uh, passes through the diaphragm and enters into the abdominal cavity 
where the number of tributaries uh, give blood to the inferior vena cava. What are those tributaries? You see, inferior phrenic vein. Phrenic, I uh, told you in last class, if you listen, phrenic, that refers to what? Anybody? Diaphragm, right? Remember that? Diaphragm. So, inferior phrenic veins receive deoxygenated blood from the diaphragm and give to the inferior vena cava. You have hepatic veins from the liver bring deoxygenated blood from the liver. You have right and left renal veins from the kidneys. Now, here, something exceptional, you see here, suprarenal veins. In case of arterial system, right and left suprarenal veins directly bring blood into the aorta from the suprarenal or adrenal glands. But here, in case of veins, you see, the right suprarenal vein gets blood from the adrenal, right adrenal gland and directly goes to the inferior vena cava. But you see now left suprarenal vein, it is not going directly to the inferior vena cava. It is going to the left renal vein. You see in the picture, from left adrenal gland, this is the left suprarenal vein, not going to the inferior vena cava, going to the left renal vein, then the blood goes to the inferior vena cava. So this is exception. In case of arteries, both go directly to the abdominal aorta from the adrenal gland. If I ask you in the test, uh, remember that. Okay. Then you have right and left gonadal veins. Uh, those are uh, getting blood from the gonads. Test is over is. Okay. Uh, now, you see the lower end of inferior vena cava divides into right and left common iliac. Then common iliac divides into external, which is larger and internal which is smaller okay external goes to the lower limb to the thigh and becomes what femoral right femoral but remember from the upper part of femoral the longest vein of the body arises that's the great saphenous vein goes all the way to the foot right uh, now, red saphenous is superficial, femoral is deep. Okay. Then, femoral becomes popliteal. Popliteal gives a small saphenous vein, that is uh, one superficial vein. And then the popliteal goes down a little bit here, you see, and divides it to anterior and posterior tibial veins and the fibular vein arises from the posterior tibial. You see this is anterior tibial, this is posterior tibial, the fibular arises from posterior tibial, right? So popliteal continues a little bit down and gives anterior posterior tibial and fibular arises from posterior tibia. Uh, but small saphenous directly arises from the popliteal. Uh, here you see uh, this is better. You see popliteal vein, right? And you see the small saphenous arises from popliteal. Then popliteal goes down a little bit and divides into anterior tibial, posterior tibial. From posterior you get the fibular vein. Okay. Now, uh, if you go to the foot, you see the posterior tibial in the foot, uh, sole of the foot in the plantar surface divides into two, the plantar veins, two plantar veins, they join uh, just uh, proximal to the toes and form the arch. That's the deep plantar arch. And from there, the digital veins arise. So, digital veins are the tributaries of deep plantar arch. 
so that's the posterior tibial vein. Okay, goes to the plantar surface of the foot. That means the sole of the foot divides it to two, and then they join uh, to form the arch from there. Is tell me. Hepatic portal system. You must remember when I showed you uh, different types of circulation in adult body, we have systemic pulmonary and hepatic portal or portal circulation. What is that? Portal circulation is not directly connected to the heart. The portal circulation or hepatic portal circulation is the circulation between your gastrointestinal tract or GI tract and the liver. Now, why this is important? Because you know that food is absorbed in the intestine. So this is GI tract and this is your liver. Okay. What happens that capillaries in the wall of GI tract, these capillaries receive nutrients from the food right, by absorption. So nutrients enter into the capillaries in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract and the nutrients are then taken to the liver by hepatic portal head. Why nutrients are taken from the intestine to the liver? Because liver is the first organ that processes the nutrients. So nutrients are first process, processed in the liver. That's why from the GI tract or intestine, the nutrients are taken by the blood to the liver. And that vein that is taking the blood to the liver is the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein. Now, why we say the word or use the word portal? In your body, you have few portal circulations. What is that? Uh, remember, this is important. If you know normally what happens, you already know that smallest arteries are arterioles, then the capillaries are formed from the arterioles, end of the arterioles, then the vein. That is normal, right? I showed you before. But if you see in your body anywhere, two capillary beds, like here in the wall of GI tract, you have capillary bed, capillary bed, and inside the liver, you have capillary bed, another capillary bed. So, two capillary beds are connected by a vein, and that is called the portal vein. If you see uh, the end of the blood vessel is attached to two sets of capillaries uh, at both ends, that in that case we use the term portal, portal circulation. So the purpose of hepatic portal circulation is taking the nutrients from the intestine or GI tract to the liver. Why? Because liver is the organ that process uh, that processes the nutrients first then from the liver the nutrients will go to the other parts of the body here you see uh, the hepatic portal circulation you see the stomach small intestine large intestine those are the main parts of your gi tract right so from the stomach gastric vein from the small intestine and large intestine you already know mesenteric in last class we talked about mesenteric artery right 
So, from the upper part of the intestine, superior mesenteric, from the lower part of the intestine, inferior mesenteric. So, those three are important. Gastric, from the stomach, superior mesenteric, from the upper part of the intestine, inferior mesenteric, from the lower part of the intestine. Okay? So, those veins give the blood to the hepatic portal vein, to this vein. And then the hepatic portal vein takes the blood to the liver. So, you see it uh, in this picture very nicely shown. <coughs> okay. So, those are the important veins uh, you need to uh, know. Now, we will talk about the capillaries. Capillaries are different than arteries and veins. How the capillaries are different, I have already mentioned, explained to you. The capillary wall is extremely thin, right? Only a single layer of squamous cells form the capillary wall. Now, capillary wall is thin that helps in the exchange of chemicals, right? Because through the wall of the capillaries, exchange of chemicals. Which chemicals? I mentioned gases, right? Oxygen, carbon dioxide. Nutrients, metabolic waste, right? Those chemicals are exchanged through the capillary wall. Arteries and veins are just to transport the blood, right? So, three types of capillaries uh, are present in the body continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries. So, we will talk about these three types of capillaries, how they are different from each other and where in the body you will find these capillaries. Okay, so two things. <coughs> uh, continuous capillaries are least for us. Least for us. That means, uh, will not allow many chemicals pass through it. Why? Because plenty of tight junctions are present and the tight junctions connect the endothelial cells or simple squamous cells, same thing, to each other and that is why uh, this wall is least for us because of tight junctions, because of plenty of tight junctions, the, uh, you know, least permeable. Make sense? Okay. Uh, now, uh, there are intercellular clefts. You know, have you heard the word cleft? You have, I am sure, you know, lip cleft, palate, cleft palate. That means gap, right? So, there are uh, intercellular clefts. That means the clefts or spaces between the cells. Although, there are tight junctions. So, you see here, uh, this is one squamous cell. This is another squamous cell. And the clefts are present in between them. And through the cleft, uh, fluid and small solutes can pass. Location abundant in the skin and muscles. So, in the skin and the muscles, you will see uh, this type of capillaries a lot, continuous capillaries. Okay? You need to remember the location. Now, in your brain, you also have continuous capillaries, but the continuous capillaries of the brain is different than the continuous capillaries in the skin and muscle. 
how in the plain continuous capillaries you have complete tight junctions and that makes the continuous capillaries in the plane less porous or less permeable which is very important because you know that brain is highly sensitive right more sensitive than skin and muscle brain tissue can easily die right neurons can easily die that's why the continuous capillaries in the brain um, have more tight junctions okay more complete tight junctions so highly you know uh, uh, i'll say won't allow the chemicals to get out from the blood won't allow many chemicals to get out easily get out from the blood because if uh, you know uh, some chemicals those are harmful can be harmful for the brain if they can get out then that will kill the neurons kill the brain tissue so the capillaries continuous capillaries although these are continuous type capillaries but different than the continuous capillaries in the skin and the muscle to protect the brain they have more complete tight junctions here you see uh, the wall of a continuous capillary you see the clefts intercellular clefts between the cells so this is the wall you see this is one squamous cell black cell nucleus right this is another squamous cell this is another squamous cell and in between the squamous cells you have clefts so the small solutes and fluid can pass but not larger solutes uh fenestrated capillaries another type of capillaries fenestrated are more permeable than continuous continuous is least more permeable and not only clefts are present in between the squamous cells so see here again i'm right these are the squamous cells nucleus and the cleft uh, in case of fenestrated capillaries the clefts are larger so this space intercellular cleft is bigger than continuous that is one so more permeable another thing is some channels are present through the endothelial cells like this so this is interesting that not only in between the cells not only intercellular clefts but also pores or channels are present inside the squamous cells or endothelial cells uh, <coughs> now where you will find the fenestrated capillaries you will find in those organs where absorption or filtration takes place so we know that in the intestine absorption occurs right so small intestine is the main part of gi tract where absorption of nutrients takes place endocrine glands secretion and kidneys filtration so just add another word not only absorption and filtration but also secretion so absorption secretion filtration absorption in the intestine secretion in the glands and filtration in the kidneys and the capillaries in these organs are fenestrated type capillaries now you understand since that clefts are larger than continuous right in fenestrated so easily secretion can occur from the gland you know the uh, uh, chemicals can be secreted and easily enter into the blood through the 
and stations. Filtration can easily occur because in the kidneys, you know that uh, metabolic wastes must get out from the blood, from the capillaries, right? So, must have fenestrations. So, the toxic chemicals can get out easily, right? And get out through the urine. But now think that if toxic chemicals get out in your brain or in your muscle, is that good? Toxic chemicals from the blood gets out and enter into your brain, not good, right? Enter into your muscle or skin, not good. But enters into the kidney is good because kidney will filter and excrete them out from the That's why it should happen in the kidney. That's why you have fenestrated capillaries. You see here, you have intercellular clefts as well as pores in the endothelial cells. So you see these are the pores in the endothelial cell and these are the intercellular clefts. So, because of both, these capillaries are more permeable than continuous. <coughs> now, sinusoidal. Sinusoidal capillaries are most permeable. Allow the large molecules. You see, allow large molecules or even the blood cells to get out or get in through the sinusoidal capillaries. So, large molecules as well as blood cells can get out or get in through the sinusoidal capillaries. Uh, only few tight junctions, larger intercellular clefts and large lumen. Now, where you will find sinusoidal capillaries in the liver, bone marrow and the spleen? Now, let's first see the wall of the uh, sinusoidal capillaries. You see intercellular clefts are very large, right? The space in between the cells is very large. So, large solutes as well as blood cells can even pass through. Also, the pores in the squamous cell, you see here, the pores are very large. So, most permeable, if you just compare with the fenestrated, you see pores are smaller, intercellular clefts are smaller, right? But if you see now the sinusoidal, those are larger. Now, how the sinusoidal capillaries help? in those organs, in the liver, spleen, bone marrow. Very simple. Which organs are called the graveyards of blood cells, dead blood cells? It's allowed. Liver and spleen. You should know by now. So, liver and spleen, right? Those are called the graveyards. Did I talk about that? Yeah. Okay. So, old blood cells when they go to the liver and the spleen, they get out from the blood and enter into the liver and the spleen tissue. So, in those organs you have sinusoidal capillaries, so the blood cells, old blood cells can easily get out, make sense? Because of larger clefts. Is it clear? Because the old cells must get out and then be destroyed by the macrophages. That's why in those organs you have sinusoidal. How, why in the bone marrow? What do you think? Those two we understand that because old cells get out in the, uh, to the liver and spleen then are destroyed. You know, new cells, right? New blood cells are produced where? In the bone marrow, right? So after new blood cells are produced, they must enter into the blood. So through the capillary wall, sinusoidal capillary wall, they can enter into the blood. Make sense? New, newly produced blood cells. <coughs> capillary bed. You already know that the capillaries anastomose to form bed called the capillary bed. Uh, so, 
what happens the capillaries so this is the arterial i showed you before these are the capillaries and they get connected to each other and form the capillary bed then the venule so this is venule this is arterial this is the capillary bed okay so <coughs> anastomosis means branching and getting connected to each other so uh, branches get connected to each other to form the capillary bed so this is a capillary bed you see uh, between the arterial and venule now uh, two types of capillaries uh, are present in the bed one is called true capillaries and another is the matte arterial what is the difference you see uh, true capillaries form many branches and get connected to each other and astomos and form the bed so these are true capillaries they form network but also there are capillaries they don't form anastomosis they directly take the blood from the arterial to the venule this is mat artery through clear channel not forming anastomosis going directly taking blood directly to the venule so here you see this is the mat arterial uh, and rest part the uh, network is formed by the true capillaries okay so uh, the exchange occurs through the wall of true capillaries now uh, you see from mat arterial the true capillaries arise and at the junction of true capillaries and mat arterial you have sphincters you see the sphincters here this is the mat arterial right and these are true capillaries so at the junction you have the sphincters these are called pre capillary sphincters pre capillary sphincters and these sphincters regulate or control the amount of blood that will enter into the capillary bed from the mat arterial makes sense so from the mat arterial how much blood will enter into the capillary bed or true capillaries is regulated or controlled by the pre capillary sphincters which is very important makes sense so when the sphincters are constricted what will happen the capillary get the capillary bed will get more or less blood less blood right when the sphincters are relaxed more blood will enter into the capillary bed right and you know that in your tissue for example in your muscle or skin you your the flow of blood is not always constant or same right you know that when you do exercise in your muscle you need what more blood flow right so the pre capillary sphincters will relax right let more blood flow in the muscle right in winter your metabolism is low so your muscle activity is less so in cold right if you are in cold the muscle activity is less so sphincter will constrict because your muscle doesn't need lot of oxygen or blood flow makes sense so more activity more blood flow is needed makes sense clear because more activity more metabolism more oxygen more nutrients are needed this is just an example uh, like how the pre capillary sphincters uh, uh, work constrict or relax if pre capillary sphincters are relaxed you see the upper picture the capillary bed gets lot of blood right and if the cap pre capillary sphincters are constricted heavily the capillary bed will not get blood 
so the blood flow will be very small if strongly constricted. <coughs> uh, in last class, I uh, talked about the differences between the arteries and veins. Again, just quickly going over, arterial wall is thick, venous wall, wall of a vein is thin, right? That's why the lumen is smaller in artery, right? Because wall is thick. And since the wall is thick, the lumen always opens what? Round and open. Is it clear? Since the venous uh, uh, wall of the vein is thin, when the vein is empty, the lumen will get flat. It will get flat. Uh, inside the artery, the pressure is high. In, inside the vein, the pressure is low. That makes sense because who receives the blood from the heart first? The arteries, right? When the ventricle contacts, the arteries get the blood from the ventricle. Make sense? Then what happens is, see, the blood passes through all the arteries, large artery, medium sized, right? Smaller arteries, then enters into the capillary bed. Right? It's very slow because capillary bed is a network, right? Very narrow blood vessel. So blood pass, passes through the capillary bed, gets very slow, and then enters into the venous system. Is it clear? So when the blood reaches there into the vein, already very slow. Make sense? So the flow is slow, less. So the pressure inside the vein is much lower than the artery. Make sense? Okay. Uh, inside the large veins, you have valves. Inside the artery, you don't have valves. For example, uh, particularly uh, in the large veins of your leg, you remember great saphenous vein, right? Small saphenous vein. Uh, you will see many one-way valves are present there. Will only open upwards. So blood that will go up will not be able to go down because you know because of gravitational force the, the blood may you know try to go down but because the flow is slow so the valves will not let the blood go down Make sense so towards the heart only blood will go towards the heart back towards the heart so in uh, large veins in the body you have many valves but in artery you don't need valves because the flow is fast Blood pressure. This is a very important topic. You all know that blood pressure. What is blood pressure? Its name is telling you, right? What is blood pressure? Pressure of blood. On what? On the arterial wall, right? So, blood pressure is the pressure exerted by the heart, uh, blood. Are given by the blood. Simple word. Blood pressure is the pressure exerted or given by the blood on what? The arterial wall. Make sense? When it flows through the artery. That's the definition, right? Make sense? On the arterial wall. You don't measure the blood pressure on venous wall wall of the vein, you measure the brachial artery or another artery, right? Arterial wall. Okay. Uh, so, blood pressure is the pressure given by the blood on the arterial wall while the blood passes through it. Now, another word you add there, I like that. Blood pressure is the lateral pressure, L-A-T-E-R-A-L, -E lateral pressure. Why I say that, you see here, this is the artery, blood flows like this. Most of the pressure is going this way, right? Because blood is flowing that way. And that pressure is not falling on the wall. So the pressure we are measuring on the arterial wall is the pressure that is going that way towards the artery. This is the lateral pressure, okay? Not the longitudinal pressure. So, lateral pressure that we measure on the arterial 
one. <coughs> now, uh, there are four types of pressure that we measure. Two we measure directly from the arterial wall. You all know that systolic and diastolic, right? Those two we get directly from the arterial wall. Other two we calculate from the systolic and diastolic. So let's see. Systolic pressure is the pressure exerted during the ventricular contraction. So when the ventricle contracts, blood enters into the arterial system, right? You know that. Is it right? When ventricle contracts, blood enters into the arterial system. So during that time, the pressure on the arterial wall is the systolic pressure. Systole means contraction actually during ventricular contraction. Diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure during the ventricular relaxation. Now you see here, look at me. When your ventricle contracts, right? Blood enters into the arteries, right? So the pressure in the arterial wall is high at that time because blood is rushing into the artery, right? So the pressure is high. Now, when the ventricle relaxes, blood comes back, right? So, less blood in the artery. Is it clear? So, pressure will start to go down. As more and more blood will get back, right? Less blood is in the artery, so pressure on the wall will be less. Is it clear? When ventricle contracts, blood goes to the artery. When ventricle relaxes, blood comes back into the artery, right? So, when you have more blood, more pressure. Less blood, less pressure, right? So those that's why two pressure we get from the arterial wall. Maximum pressure during the ventricular contraction, that is systolic pressure. Minimum pressure during the ventricular relaxation, that's the diastolic pressure. So one is very high, another is low. I'll say like you know 100 to 130 millimeter of mercury. And diastolic is 60 to 90 millimeter of marker. Okay, but a different book uh, could be slightly different. Uh, so this is the uh, typical range. Now, if the pressure goes above the upper limit, that is hypertension or high blood pressure, right? And less than the lower limit, that's the hypotension or lower blood pressure, low blood pressure. <coughs> now, uh, two other pressures we get from systolic and diastolic. What are those two? Pulse pressure and mean arterial pressure. Pulse pressure is very easy to calculate. It's the difference between systolic and diastolic. So if someone's systolic pressure is 130 and diastolic is 60, then what will be the pulse pressure? 70 millimeter of mercury, right? So the difference, very simple, the difference between systolic and diastolic. Now, the Mean arterial pressure is calculated by mean arterial pressure or MAP is diastolic plus one third of pulse pressure. Diastolic plus one third of pulse. So in this case, diastolic is what? 60, 60, right? So 60 and pulse is what? 70, right? This is the pulse pressure. So one third of it. So one third of 70. So if you add this to 60 plus one third of 70 is 23.3. That right? 23.33. So 
If you add this two, that gives you what? 83.6. So that's the main arterial pressure. That's really plus one third of pulse. That's all. Now, mean arterial pressure should be normally at least 80 millimeter of mercury. If it is less than 80 millimeter of mercury, that is not good. Okay, so at least the mean arterial pressure when you measure, calculate, uh, should be 80. If it goes below 80, that means your internal organs, the organs of your body are getting less blood. Okay, the pressure is low, getting less blood. Yes. Okay. Now, three factors directly influence the blood pressure. Directly influence the blood pressure. What are those three factors? Cardiac output, pressure resistance, and blood volume. Very simple. Blood pressure is the pressure given by who? Blood pressure is the pressure given by? I just mentioned five times. What's the definition of blood? The pressure. Blood pressure is the pressure given by? Its name is telling you. Blood. <laughs> given by the blood. On the arterial wall, right? So, given by the blood. So, if blood is more, pressure on the arterial wall will be more. Make sense? If the blood is less, volume is less, pressure will be what? Less. So, that is one, right? Factor. More blood, more pressure, less blood, less pressure. Okay? So, that is one directly, the factor directly affect the blood pressure. Make sense? If someone has less volume of blood, pressure will be less. Number two, cardiac output. Cardiac output, so let me write down all three, uh, volume, blood volume, blood volume more, pressure is high, pressure is high, okay. Another factor is cardiac output, cardiac output is the amount of blood pushed out from the ventricle in one minute. Now you see here, it is very simple. If this is your heart, okay, two conditions. You see your heart is contracting very forcefully, forceful contraction, okay. Then a lot of blood will go to the artery, right. Now if someone's heart is weak, contracts weakly like this, half, not complete, half. So, less blood will go to the arteries. Is it clear? So, in which condition the pressure will be more fast, right? When the contraction is forceful. Is it clear? More blood will get out. Will enter into the artery, pressure will be higher. So, that's the force of contraction. Cardiac output is how much blood is getting out in one minute. That depends on the force of contraction, right? And So cardiac output uh, is more, blood pressure is high. Okay. Another factor is peripheral resistance. This is interesting. Peripheral resistance, peripheral, that means not heart, heart is central, remember. In cardiovascular system, who is in the center? Heart, right? And peripheral organs are what? Arteries, veins, the blood vessels, right? So here, the term peripheral indicates the blood vessels. Peripheral resistance. Now you tell me, you have two blood vessels. This is one and this is another. This one is healthy. No fat is inside. And in this one, this person eats a lot of fat. So fat 
has accumulated in the wall. Atherosclerosis, you know that. So the resistance will be higher in which wall? This one or this one? This one, right? Resistance is high because narrow. Tube is narrow, right? So that is the peripheral resistance. If the peripheral resistance increases, the blood pressure increases. So peripheral indicates, remember, the blood vessels, not the heart. So this one is directly related to the force of contraction of what? Heart, right? Cardiac output, more force, more blood will get out. So this is directly related to the heart. This is peripheral resistance is directed, directly related to the size of the lumen. Blood vessel. Okay. Now, uh, in two conditions, the peripheral resistance often increases. One is, I mentioned here, that accumulation of fat, that is called atherosclerosis, fat accumulation, that makes the lumen narrow, pressure will be high, paper resistance will be high. Another condition that happens in old days, what happens, the elasticity is lost in the wall. So, since the elasticity decreases, the arteries cannot expand. Elastic fibers are gone. So, the resistance is high. So, if decrease elasticity, peripheral resistance increases because arteries cannot expand, makes sense? When the blood will go, arteries will not expand, will remain like that, so pressure will be more. So, hardening of the wall due to decreased elasticity, that condition is called arterium, arteriosclerosis. So, this is atherosclerosis, fat accumulation, narrowing of the lumen and hardening of the wall due to loss of elastic fiber or elasticity is called arterial sclerosis. The two different conditions both increase the peripheral resistance. Okay? <coughs> Regulation of blood pressure two types of regulation of, of blood pressure present in our system. One is called short term regulation of blood pressure and another is called the long term regulation. Now, uh, if your blood pressure suddenly increases, okay, who are the control centers of your body? Anybody remember from NP1? I used to ask this question a lot. Two systems are called the control systems. Which two? Endocrine and nervous, right? So, those two systems regulate the other systems. Make sense? That's why they, those are called the control systems. Endocrine and nervous. So, when suddenly blood pressure increases like you got scared right your blood pressure has gone up after a few minutes you know that blood pressure comes down right so who work to bring the blood pressure back to normal your endocrine system and nervous system because those are the control systems of the body makes sense so makes sense so the nervous system will send signal to the heart to the SNO node and tell that you know, slow down, okay? And we'll also send signal to the wall of the blood vessel because peripheral resistance, you remember? If the blood vessels dilate, pressure will be less, 
constrict narrow pressure will be more right so the brain and the endocrine system that means nervous and endocrine system both will work on the heart and the blood vessels if the blood pressure goes up they will send signal to the heart and tell the heart to slow down decrease the force of contraction make sense decrease the force of contraction so blood pressure will be low and will cause what vasodilation so pressure on the wall will be less so work on the heart and the blood vessels but immediately that's why those are short term belong to short term regulation make sense you know your nervous system acts very fast right electrical signal endocrine is also within few minutes it will start to work now long term regulation is done by the urinary system kidneys by changing the volume of blood that's that takes time because in that case kidneys will do what will produce more urine and urine will get out from the body water will get out from the body blood volume will go down and that will decrease the blood pressure because blood pressure is given by the blood so if the blood volume is less pressure is less you already know that right so but it takes some time for the kidneys to produce urine and water to get out from the body so that's why that is long term regulation makes sense uh, you know if someone gets uh, high blood pressure and if you cannot control then if you take that person to hospital they will do what they will keep the medicine that will produce more urine right so urine will get out water will get out blood volume will go down blood pressure will be less right but uh, immediately to work your your uh, medicine should work on the heart and the blood vessels if you immediately dilate the blood vessel pressure will go down force of contraction reduce the pressure will go down so those are the regulations of the blood pressure now the question is how the brain and endocrine system will know that blood pressure is high or low because brain is brain central nervous system and endocrine system those must know first that the blood pressure has been changed blood pressure has decreased or increased so you have detectors or sensors in the wall of the arteries because the pressure changes in the wall of the arteries that's why you need the detectors there this is the aortic arch in the aortic arch you have some receptors they can detect the change of pressure on the arterial wall also you know the common carotid artery arises from the aortic arch external carotid internal carotid you remember that so at that bifurcation division external and internal carotid in this area you have plenty of pressure receptors those are called the barrel receptors barrel means pressure you know that probably you have heard barometer have you heard barometer the tool barometer to measure the pressure so barrel means what pressure so barrel receptors are the receptors they are located in the arterial wall particularly in the wall of aortic arch aorta and the common carotid where it divides into external and internal and in some other neck and thoracic arteries so other neck and thoracic arteries basically in this area you have plenty of barrel receptors okay aortic arch common carotid where divides and also some amount in the other arteries of neck and thorax and when the pressure blood pressure increases these receptors get activated they can detect it and 
send signal to the control centers. For example, to the brain. And then control center will do what? Send signal to the heart, you know, SA node, AV node, you have those heart muscle. So, it will send signal to the heart as well as to the wall of the blood vessel. So, if the blood pressure is high, what kind of signal the control centers should send to the heart? You already know now. We will tell the heart slow down, right? Decrease the force of contraction. If force of contraction increases, then pressure will go higher, right? So, decrease the force of contraction. And what kind of signal will go to the wall of the blood vessel? Relax, so dilatation, SO, dilatation, that will decrease the blood pressure, okay? So, blood vessel dilates, if the pressure increases, heart, force of contraction or cardiac output decreases, okay? So both will decrease the blood pressure. This will decrease the peripheral resistance. This will decrease the amount of blood gets up. Just opposite will happen if the blood pressure decreases. Now if the blood pressure is low, then these receptors will also detect that, send signal to the control center. Control center will do what? Vasoconstriction. If the lumen gets narrow, pressure will go up. Okay. So in this case, constriction will occur and increase the force of contraction that will increase the cardiac output so blood pressure will increase Makes sense? so that's how the <coughs> blood pressure uh, is controlled by the baroreceptors now if you uh, just uh, look at uh, this picture you will understand you see signal from the brain going to the heart and blood vessel and we causing those changes, okay? <clears throat> hormones. Uh, which hormones uh, control the blood pressure? Adrenal Medulla uh, releases adrenaline or adrenaline. Those are also called epinephrine or epinephrine. Same thing. Adrenaline, noradrenaline are also known as epinephrine, noradrenaline. You probably have heard adrenaline more, right? Same thing. Uh, comes, uh, both come from the adrenal gland. Which part of the adrenal gland? Medulla. Angiotensin 2 is produced. Uh, in the kidneys and work directly on the blood vessel and causes vasoconstriction. Angiotensin 2 causes what? Vasoconstriction. So that increases the blood pressure. Adrenaline works on the heart, increases the force of contraction. So blood pressure increases. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, work on the blood vessels and increase the blood pressure. Angio means blood vessel tensing pressure. ANP, atrial nitriuretic peptide. ANP is another uh, chemical that comes from the wall of the heart, atrial wall. That's why called atrial nitriuretic peptide. This peptide chemical uh, is secreted from the atrial wall, wall of the atrium, and uh, this one, uh, this is the only one uh, that decreases the blood pressure, decreases the blood pressure. Others, you know, adrenaline increases the blood pressure by working, increasing the force of contraction of the heart, and latency by vasoconstriction, and if you go ADH, antidiuretic hormone. This hormone comes from posterior pituitary gland. Probably you remember 
from NP1, posterior pituitary hormone, antidiuretic hormone. Works on the nephron of the kidney. You know, inside the kidney you have million of nephrons. And this one comes from posterior pituitary in the brain, pituitary gland, right? And goes to the kidney and works on the nephron and takes the water back from the urine. Here, inside the nephron, you have the urine, the kidney, and water is taken back into the body by antidiuretic hormone. Okay? So, antidiuretic hormone will go to the kidney and reabsorbs water. That is called taking back, reabsorption of water into the body. So, what will happen? If more ADH, more water will be taken back into the body. Is it clear? So, blood volume will go up, blood pressure will go up. There is aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone comes from adrenal gland. So, this hormone comes from the adrenal gland and this one reabsorbs sodium and water from the kidney. That means, takes the sodium back into the body, water back into the body. And that's the aldosterone. Come from the adrenal gland. And this one, since reabsorbs sodium, in your blood sodium will go up and you know sodium, if sodium goes up, blood pressure goes up, right? Sodium, you eat the salt, uh, you know. So doctors, if someone has high blood pressure, tell not to take too much salt because sodium is there, right? So, more sodium, more water will increase the blood pressure, okay? So, <coughs> except ANP, others increase the blood pressure but different ways. ADH and aldosterone by increasing the blood volume uh, mainly. Angiotensin 2 is causing vasoconstriction, constricting the blood vessels, increasing the peripheral resistance. And adrenaline, noradrenaline, force of contraction changes the cardiac output. Uh, last thing that I want to tell you, angiotensin 2, do you remember the hormone angiotensin 2 here that works on the blood vessel and causes constriction. But the kidney produces a chemical that is called renin. Okay, renin works on angiotensinogen. This is an inactive chemical. Inactive chemical angiotensinogen present in the blood. Renin is produced in the kidney and works on the angiotensinogen and converts it to angiotensin 1. Okay, angiotensin 1. Then the angiotensin 1 uh, is converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 1 then is converted to angiotensin Two. This is the most active form. Okay. And to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, an enzyme that works that is called angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE. Okay. Angiotensin converting enzyme that converts the 1 to 2. This one uh, mostly comes from the liver and lung. Uh, produce there and work on angiotensin 1 to angi uh, and conversion to angiotensin 2. Now, this angiotensin 2 directly works on the wall of the blood vessel 
and causes constriction. Okay, constriction of the blood vessel that increases the blood pressure. Okay, so that's how the angiotensin 2 is produced. Okay. Uh, so that's all. Uh,